Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Asia Darbinian, and I am the Executive Director of Change, the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education, housed at Brookdale Community College in Lincroft, New Jersey, on the territory of Lenny Lenape people. Welcome to our virtual event to commemorate the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. January 27, 2024, marked 79 years since the liberation of the Auschwitz camp complex. Thank you for joining us this evening to commemorate, remember, and learn together. First, a couple of um, housekeeping items regarding tonight's program. You will see that uh, your audio is muted when you enter, and it will remain muted throughout the program. The chat box is enabled, so please feel free to communicate with each other via chat. Please make sure to send the questions for our speakers directly to me in chat and not to everyone in chat box. That would make it easier for me to read those questions. And at the end of the presentation, I will pose the questions to our speakers. Before we begin, I would like to thank Change's Special Project Co-Director Susan Yellen, Board Member Linda Milston, Volunteer Friend Samaya, our staff Rachel McCauley and Suzanne Esterman for putting tonight's program together and running it via Zoom. An extra warm thank you to our program sponsors, Pam and our doorman, as well as to our generous donors and members. Today, we are fortunate to have with us two amazing scholars, Dr. Elizabeth Barry White and Dr. Joanna Sleva, to present the result of many years of their meticulous research and detective-like work. Their brand new book, The Counterfeit Compass, The Jewish Woman Who Rescued Thousands of Poles During the Holocaust, published by Simon & Schuster, uncovers the somewhat neglected history, or we can even say unknown history, of Countess Janina Sukhodowska, or Dr. Josephine Janina Melberg, who accomplished the seemingly impossible. She rescued Poles during World War II while keeping her Jewish identity hidden to survive the Holocaust. So allow me to introduce to you our two speakers. Dr. Elizabeth Barry White is a professional historian with a PhD from University of Virginia and an expert on Holocaust, genocide, and international criminal justice. She has directed research to investigate and prosecute Nazi criminals and other human rights violators for the US Justice Department, serving as deputy director and chief historian of the Office of Special Investigations and Deputy Chief and Chief Historian of the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Sections. For the US State Department, Dr. White traced gold looted from Nazi victims, including gold teeth, to the post-war accounts of European central banks, leading to the establishment of an international um, assistance fund for Holocaust survivors. At the USHMM, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, she served as the research director of the Center for the Prevention of Genocide and as a historian in the Senior Historian Office. Dr. Joanna Sliva is a historian at the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, also known as Claims Conference, where she also administers academic programs. Her research centers on the history of Claims Conference and compensations for Holocaust survivors. She earned her doctoral degree at the Stressler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies of Clark University. Dr. Sliwa's own scholarship focuses on the Holocaust in Poland and on Polish Jewish history. Her book, Jewish Childhood in Krakow, a microhistory of the Holocaust, received the 2020 Ernst Frankel Prize from the Wiener Holocaust Library. Dr. Sliba taught at a number of universities and has consulted for projects ranging from teacher training programs to academic texts, websites, films, TV programs, and exhibits. 
Thank you for joining us this evening, Dr. Sliva and Dr. White. Now I'm muting myself and handing it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Darbenian, Asia. We will not pretend that we don't know each other. Um, thank you so much for inviting Barry and me to speak today. Thank you to everyone who organized this program today. And thank you to everyone in the audience for attending this program. We are very, very honored to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day by sharing with you the remarkable story of Yanina Melberg, a Jewish woman whose actions led to the rescue of thousands of non-Jewish Poles during World War II. One person changed the course of Janina's life. In December 1941, the German authorities were establishing a ghetto for Jews in Lviv, today Lviv in Ukraine. And on the slide, you see an announcement and the map of the planned ghetto. As Jews, Yanina and her husband Henry had to move there. They realized, of course, that death awaited them in the ghetto. While they were preparing to flee to Henry's hometown, they heard a knock on the door. Standing before them was Count Andrzej Skrzynski. He had been a friend of the Melbergs, uh, of the, he had been a friend of the Spinners, Yanina's late um, parents. Skrzynski took the first civilian train from Lublin to Lvov. His goal was to find the Melbergs and help them leave Lvov. Without proper papers that identified them as ethnic Poles, the Melbergs boarded a train headed with Skrzynski heading to Lublin. They hoped that their flawless Polish being in the company of a Polish nobleman, and yes, a dose of luck, would ensure their safe passage to Lublin. And it did. And here in this photograph, you see, this is a post-war photograph of Andrzej Skrzynski getting married to his fourth wife at the time. And you see the map of the escape of the Melbergs with Skrzynski from Lwów through Denbica up to Lublin. But the situation turned grave upon their arrival in Lublin. A German policeman detained Henry at the station. The official informed Yanina that taking baggage out of Galicia, that was the fifth district of the general government, German occupied Poland, was prohibited and it entailed a fine. Yanina in that moment knew that she had to be fast and persuasive. Otherwise, the couple would have to show identification papers, which they did not have, and they would be exposed as Jews. Yanina managed to avert the danger by boldly confronting the officer, the, the official. And for the next three years, she would continue this tactic as a way to survive and save lives while living under a false identity as the Countess Yanina Suhodolska. This was the identity that she received from her rescuer, Count Skrzynski. Yanina's upbringing and experiences prepared her to perform this alias. She was born to a Jewish family as Pepi Spinner in 1905 in Żurawno. At the time, the town was in the Austrian Empire, and it later became Sorry, and it later became part of Poland, and to, which today is Ukraine. Pepi's father was a wealthy landowner who mingled with the local nobility, and Pepi enjoyed a privileged life. She was taught by private tutors, and she gained fluency in several languages. Pepi was a gifted student in mathematics and she obtained a PhD degree in 1928 from Jan Kazimierz University in Lwów. And that's also where she met her fellow PhD student, Henry Melberg. 
They were married in 1933, and they settled in Lvov, where they led lives as Polish Jewish intellectuals. In September 1939, Germany attacked Poland from the West, and the Soviet Union occupied Eastern Poland. Lvov became a Soviet city. Pepe and Henry feared that they would be deported by the Soviet authorities to Siberia, along with thousands of prominent Polish intellectuals and prosperous Jews. But the Melbergs were spared. Then Nazi forces seized the city in June 1941. The local population brutally attacked their Jewish neighbors in Lvov. And then the SS Einsatzgruppen arrived, and the persecution and murder of Jews became systematic. This sent a message to Jews, including to the Malbergs, that their lives were in danger. And so Yanina and Henry seized the opportunity to live as supposed Aryans in Lublin. But they quickly discovered that they still faced persecution and death as ethnic Poles. Now, in order to understand Yanina's story and the Holocaust, it's important to consider two key contexts in which they occurred, World War II and Nazi plans to impose a racist new order in Europe. From the moment Hitler came to power, his goal was to conquer Lebensraum, or living space, uh, for the German people. This area was to run all the way from Germany eastward to the Ural Mountains, and it was to be populated only by Germans. Some of the indigenous population might be kept for a while to serve as slaves for the German masters, but there would be no Jews anywhere that Germans lived. Now in 1939, Hitler didn't have a specific vision for how that was going to happen, but the conquest of Poland gave him a proving ground to test approaches. So Germany annexed Poland's Western provinces to the Reich and turned what was left, including the district of Lublin, into a colony called the general government. The Germans immediately sought to make the Western provinces majority German by forcibly deporting hundreds of thousands of ethnic Poles and Jews into the general government. Hitler also envisioned creating a reservation in part of Lublin district where all the Jews under German control would be dumped and a huge wall would be built to keep them from escaping. But even these were going to be temporary measures uh, because ultimately, that all of the Poland was going to be made German. To prepare for that time, the Germans adopted measures to isolate Poland's Jews physically and economically and to decimate their numbers by forcing them to perform brutal forced labor, subjecting them to live in conditions of mass starvation and epidemics and shooting them in reprisal actions. By the time Yanina got to Lublin in December 1941, Lub Lublin's 40,000 Jews were all sealed in a tiny ghetto where, in the words of one SS official, they were dropping like flies from starvation and disease. Now, the Nazis also viewed ethnic Poles as subhuman racial enemies, although they ranked them somewhat higher than the Jews. Hitler wanted not just to wipe Poland off the map, but to destroy all vestiges of Polish nationalism. To prevent the Poles from mounting any resistance, SS forces shot or incarcerated educated Poles, not just political and military leaders, but teachers, doctors, lawyers, and even as you can see in one picture here, priests. Just in the first four months of the German occupation, the SS shot at least 40,000 ethnic Poles as well as 7,000 Jews and put tens of thousands more in concentration camps. The Germans systematically destroyed Polish monuments, memorials, museums, and libraries, and barred Polish children from receiving anything more than a very, very basic education. They subjected Poles to a system of uh, apartheid that was very similar to that in the Jim Crow South here in the United States. 
But as with the Jews, the Germans also seized the Poles for forced labor and carried out reprisal actions that destroyed entire Polish communities and murdered their inhabitants. Unlike the Jews, though, Poles could be sent to the Reich for forced labor, and more than two million Poles were abducted in this manner, separated from their families, often leaving their children and elderly relatives with no one to support them. Food rations for Poles only provided enough calories to, to cover less than a third of what an adult needed to survive, which of course, compared to what the Jews received was still generous. In 1941 in Lublin, the flour ration for Jews came to less than one pound per person per month. In June, 1941, Nazi Germany attacked the Soviet Union in order to conquer the rest of Hitler's planned Lebensraum. And this was a uh, campaign was what J Hitler called a war of annihilation. So immediately SS Einsatzgruppen went in and began murdering male Jews and communist officials. Just by mid-July 1941, German generals were already convinced that the Red Army was just about to surrender and then the Soviet regime would fall. So Nazi leaders thought that finally that moment was coming to hand when they were going to be able to impose the racist new order. By the end of July, the Einsatzgruppen were murdering entire Jewish communities. And in Berlin, Reinhard Heydrich, the head of the security police and the SD, received the go-ahead to devise a plan for the final solution of the Jewish question. Heydrich's boss, Heinrich Himmler, who was the head of the SS and the German police, intended that his SS forces were going to dominate Germany's new lands in Eastern Europe. And Lublin played an important role in these plans. The city was going to become a huge base for SS forces and for SS-owned industry. To supply the labor for these projects, he ordered that a huge new concentration camp be built on the outskirts of the city. It was going to hold tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of Soviet POWs who would provide the forced labor for his plans. Himmler also wanted a Lublin district to be the first area of the, of the general government that was going to be made entirely German. And so he ordered his SS and police leader in Lublin, Adila Globocznik, to replace the area's Polish and Jewish inhabitants with German settlers. Globocznik's proposal for carrying out this ethnic cleansing campaign was to murder the Jews, put the able-bodied Poles to forced labor, and dump the remaining Poles in the empty ghettos. So that left the question of how to murder the Jews. And since the start of the war, Germany had developed a new technology for mass murder, the gas chamber. It had been used to murder 70,000 Germans just because they were mentally or physically disabled. So with Hitler's approval, Globocznik developed a very simple plan to murder some 2 million Jews in the general government. He was going to build very basic compounds in isolated areas along the major rail lines. The SS would ship Jews there in large numbers, and then within a few hours, asphyxiate them with carbon monoxide in sealed chambers. This plan became Operation Reinhardt, the largest murder operation of the Holocaust, which claimed 1.7 million Jewish lives, most of them at the killing centers of Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. But the war was also interfering with Hitler's plans. The Red Army didn't surrender, but in late 41, even mounted an effective counteroffensive. And in December 41, the war became truly global when the United States entered it. So Hitler decided it wasn't safe to wait until Germany, Germany's victory to proceed against what he viewed as the Germans' greatest enemies. And so he ordered the implementation of the final solution program, which was to murder all of the Jews in German-controlled Europe. In Lublin, the ongoing war was creating 
uh, shortages, particularly of building supplies. And so that was forcing the SS to cut back on Himmler's vision of a massive base and industries, and even to scale back the plans for the concentration camp that was being built at the edge of the city. The locals called this camp Maidanet. Himmler's plans to use Soviet POWs as laborers also went awry because just in the first eight months of Germany's attack on the Soviet Union, two million Soviet POWs died in German captivity, most for neglect. The first 2,000 Soviet POWs sent to Majdanek died almost immediately because they were in such terrible condition. In early 1942, Himmler decided that instead of Soviet POWs, as forced laborers, he was going to exploit the labor of some of the able-bodied Jews who were being rounded up for the final solution. And tens of thousands were sent to Majdanek to perform forced labor. When they inevitably became too starved or sick to work, which usually happened within just a few weeks, they were murdered there. During two periods, Majdanek also served as a temporary killing center where transports of Jewish men, women, and children were sent, underwent selection, and those unable to work were immediately murdered in the camp's gas chambers or shooting pits. So in this aerial photo, if you look in the upper right, uh, there's uh, one of the prisoner compounds, and just across from it, there is a U-shaped building. That's the building that housed Majdanek's gas chamber. By early 1943, it had become obvious even to Nazi leaders that the war was not going to be over anytime soon. So every able-bodied German man had to go to the front, and Germany had to find people to replace them in the factories. Himmler particularly wanted his concentration camps to be reservoirs of forced labor for German war industries. He ordered that able-bodied Poles who were either unemployed or in prisons be transferred to the camp, particularly to Majdanek and to Auschwitz. And to preserve the labor capacity of his prisoners, he ordered his commandants to take measures to reduce the mortality in their camps. These changes made it possible for the Polish Relief Organization and the general government, the Polish Main Welfare Council, or RGO, to obtain permission to supply food and medicines for the Polish prisoners at Majdanek. The RGO's lead official in Lublin district was the Mailberg's rescuer, Count Szczynski, and the person he put in charge of the relief operation at Majdanek was his secretary and office manager, Countess Janina Sukodolska. Through her work at Majdanek, Janina quickly learned of the extremely primitive and horrific conditions there. The camp had no running water and its wells were contaminated. In this slide, you can see some of the prisoner barracks that were uh, just simple horse barns with no windows. The latrines were concrete ditches out in the ocean, out, out in the open. Prisoners went a month or more without bathing or a change of clothes. They were fed a thin soup that they had to pass around amongst each other uh, in unwashed bowls. And so it, epidemics inevitably broke out and the Poles very quickly, like the Jews, became incapable of performing forced labor. And like the Jews, they were then murdered. The mortality rate of, um, among Majdanek's prisoners was the highest of any concentration camp, including Auschwitz. In this photo, you can see in the distance the chimney of the crematorium where the prisoners' bodies were burned. So Yadina became obsessed with helping the prisoners at Majdanek. She continually badgered the SS for permission to bring in ever greater quantities of food and supplies and medicines. Her goal was to supply so much food that it would even benefit the non-Polish prisoners, especially the Jews. Began to have real success when a new commandant arrived with orders to reduce the prisoner mortality rate at Majdanek. In 1944, the RGO was delivering massive quantities of food five days a week for thousands of prisoners. 
Yanina brought these deliveries herself. Next slide. No, where's the, are we missing one? Mm, no. The, the schematic of my Donald? No, we're not missing a slide. Oh, well, it was supposed to be there. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it's a schematic of Maidonic that shows you that there that the Maidonic actually had five different prisoner compounds. And Yanina actually persuaded the SS to bring her deliveries all the way in to the gate of each one of those compounds. And there she was able to interact with the prisoners who were unloading the deliveries. So she used them as cover to smuggle messages and supplies to members of the resistance in prison in the camp. Because like Count Szczynski, Janina was an officer in the underground Polish Home Army. You can already tell that we have a lot of sources, a lot of visuals, uh, and yes, so we are happy to share them afterwards, and they're, they are also included in, in our book, Maps, Schematics, and so on. But we tend to associate rescue during World War II with the help provided by non-Jews to Jews. Yanina's story is an example of flipped rescue in which a Jew living undercover as a non-Jew helped non-Jewish Poles. Yanina's positions in the Polish underground and in the RGO, the Polish Main Welfare Council, legitimized her false identity and gave her platforms to help Poles. And what you're seeing in these photo in, in the, on this slide here is a photograph of uh, Janina. At that time, we know Pepe Melberg. This was before the war. And the the other image that you see is a, 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 a secret note signed with her code name that she that she used in the Polish underground, and that was Stefania. Janina joined both organizations with the help of her rescuer, as we already know, and no one among her fellow resistance members and work colleagues, except Skrzynski, knew that Janina Suchodolska was not her real name or that she was Jewish. The RGO was the only relief organization that the Germans allowed to assist ethnic Poles there were separate organizations for Ukrainians and for Jews. Over 700,000 Poles received help from the RGO each year during the German occupation. This was a lifeline for them. The RGO provided housing, food, medicine, clothes, money, parcels for POWs. And they also organized special relief actions, which Yanina initiated and pursued in Lublin district. In her role as a member of the Polish resistance and the staff in the welfare organization, Janina had access to information about the terror that the German authorities unleashed on Poles in Lublin district. So Janina knew about the resettlement actions that the German authorities organized in the Zamość area near Lublin. And this was occurring in fall 1942. The Germans seized entire Polish families, dumped them in a former POW camp, and quickly sent off the able-bodied adults to forced labor. In February 1943, the RGO, the relief organization, finally won permission to provide aid to the Poles who were remaining in the camp. Janina resolved to provide immediate shelter and care for the children. She recruited some women in the resistance to pose as RGO workers. She sent them into the camp with the impossible mission of persuading the mothers to give their children into the workers' custody. When Janina learned that a train transport from Zamosht held 500 frozen bodies of children, her request to the relief workers turned to an order to remove the expelled children from their mothers in the camp and to bring them to Lublin to relative safety. In summer 1943, another wave of German ordered resettlements swept through the Zamosh area. 
Poles, including women, children, the elderly, were held in transit camps. And when these became overcrowded, the ex-police, about 9,000 of them, were deported to Majdanek. Many of them were deported on foot, forced to walk 50 miles. Once they were in the camp, they experienced immense overcrowding, little to no food, and abysmal sanitary conditions. For example, barracks that were intended for 250 prisoners now held 1,500 people. What did Anina do? She sprang into action. She managed to arrange for the transfer of over 150 emaciated and ill children to a hospital in Lublin. And she also managed to secure the release of over 2,000 ex-police from Majdanek. Polish peasants in Lublin responded to these resettlement actions by joining armed partisan groups. And the increasing attacks of the, of the partisans alarmed the district German rulers. So the authorities, the German authorities, decided to moderate their treatment of the Poles, hoping that this would secure the Poles' cooperation. Yanina took advantage of this change in policy. She persistently pressed Nazi and SS officials to approve measures to help Poles and to release Polish civilians from camps. And on the slide, you see the, some of the faces and the names and the positions of the individuals with whom she negotiated. She was amazingly successful. Just from the wartime records, Barry and I were able to document that Yanina was released from captivity of near, nearly 10,000 Poles. Yanina's roles in the underground and in the RGO made her a witness to the persecution of the Poles and the rescuer of those whom she could save from further suffering and a certain death. But she could not do the same for Jews. Yanina had no personal or professional connections to Lublin Jews. Um, they had, as Barry mentioned, they had been already confined in a ghetto since March 1941, so nine months before Yanina arrived in the city. And Yanina could not rescue uh, Jews either. She was limited by her own living arrangements, mindful that she was already endangering the two Polish aristocratic woman with whom she and her husband lived in Lublin. However, uh, like all residents in, of Lublin, Janina witnessed the beginning of Operation Reinhardt with the deportation of Lublin's Jews to Belzec. And through her work at Majdanek, she was very well aware that Jews were being murdered there. And she learned about what the Germans termed Aktion Erntefest, Operation Harvest Festival, in which the Germans murdered about 42,000 Jews on November 3rd to 4th, 1943. Among those murdered, among those 42,000 Jews murdered, 18,000 were shot at Majdanek. And while Yanina could not rescue the Jews, she could serve as a witness to their destruction, if only she survived. Yanina continued her relief activities in Lublin until the Soviet entry into, uh, into the city in July, 1944. But even after that, she kept her false identity, but added the title doctor and claimed specialty in social welfare. Yanina joined the leadership of the successor organization of the wartime RGO. And in this role, she traveled abroad, including to the United States, to learn about the best practices in social care. And on this slide, you see a newspaper clipping from the time where she toured the US and, and her photograph. So this is one of the sources that we discovered. But Janina also traveled around Poland. She saw the poverty and the losses that the Polish people were grappling with. She also saw the dangerous situation that Jewish survivors faced. For example, in July, 1946, 
Poles attack Jews in the city of Kielce, killing 42 people and injuring many more. This event prompted around 70,000 Jewish survivors to leave Poland almost immediately. Janina's husband, Henry, returned to his pre-war identity and his academic career, but the Melbergs understood that they were not safe in Poland. They did not see a future for themselves, especially in a place where Janina could not return to her real identity. So Henry applied for emigration from Poland a month after the pogrom in 1946. He managed to leave for Canada in 1949. Janina escaped from Poland in summer 1950, and the couple reunited soon thereafter in Canada. And you see their photograph as a happy couple, happy couple uh, when they were already reunited. The final destination for the Malbergs was the United States. They immigrated here in 1956. And quite unusually for a woman and an immigrant at that, Janina joined the mathematics faculty at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And here you see a picture of her comes from a collection of a few photographs of her showing her teaching a class at the Institute. And no one in her professional circle knew what she did during World War II, how she survived, or even that she was Jewish. Now, Yanina's silence about her experiences during the Holocaust was typical of so many survivors in the decades following the war. But sometime in the seven years before she died in 1969, she recorded those experiences in a memoir. She wrote it in Polish, and focused on her life as Countess Sukodolska. Only a few pages cover her experiences of persecution as a Jew, and almost no indication in it of how she felt witnessing the destruction of the Jews from the comparative safety of her status as a supposed ethnic Pole. So we believe that she wrote the memoir as a response to the anti-Semitic narrative of the Holocaust that was being promoted by the Polish government in the 1960s. This narrative claimed that the Poles collectively had heroically sought to rescue their Jewish neighbors, but the Jews had done nothing to resist their own destruction. It accused Polish Holocaust survivors of repaying their Polish rescuers with ingratitude and accusations of collaboration. Yanina's memoir puts the lie to that narrative. She was a Polish patriot who risked her life for her country by resisting its Nazi occupier, and she was a Jew. She was grateful to the Pole who had rescued her, and as a Jew, she had rescued Poles. After Yanina died, Henry, her husband, translated the memoir into English added a preface explaining who she was, and tried without success to get it published. This version of the memoir is what inspired us to write the book. And Yanina's memoir is inspiring not just for what it recounts about her heroic actions, but also for what it reveals about her character and her motivations. She was not fearless, but she was deeply compassionate and empathetic. And that's what drove her passionate dedication to saving lives. Her empathy made her understand that what Maidanic prisoners needed to survive was not just food, but hope. And she tried to give them that in various ways, including by supplying decorated Christmas trees and Easter eggs so that they could celebrate those holidays. Her compassion spurred her to try to extend that hope even to the prisoners who she knew had broken under torture and turned informant. And she was also unbelievably persistent. In her dealings with German officials, she never accepted no as a final answer and often went over the heads of the officials she was dealing with to their superiors in order to get to yes. And when she was told yes, she considered it an invitation to ask for even more. Henry wrote that Yanina based her actions during the war on a simple mathematical principle. One life has a lesser value than multiple lives, and her own life would have no value 
if she did not use it to save others. Yanina's story shows us how much we still do not know about the experiences of Jews during the Holocaust, their survival strategies, their modes of resistance to German persecution. We do not know of another Jewish woman during the Holocaust who performed her false identity in such a credible way to enable her to negotiate with top Nazis, including with the manager of Operation Reinhardt. These unique stories are important to understand the diversity of Jewish experiences during the Holocaust. Yanina's story also shows us how much we need personal histories to learn about the suffering of various groups of people during World War II, including of non-Jewish Poles. This is a group that has received that has not received extensive scholarly attention. And through Yanina's lens, we learn about how the German authorities treated and oppressed the Polish people and about the terror that they inflicted on them. We also learn about the self-help networks that emerged among Poles to resist Nazi persecution. Yanina was inextricably linked to these networks, especially those that were composed of women. These women used their creativity to smuggle food and medicine to prisoners and to establish lines of communication. They exhibited great bravery and perseverance when they prepared food from rationed products. These women fundraised at a time when Poles were already suffered poverty as a result of Nazi looting and destruction. And these women procured medical items, traveled as couriers, and conducted rescue operations. Yanina's example shows us the importance of leadership and cooperation in times of crisis. Survivor stories such as that of Yanina illuminate the complexities of human behavior in extreme situations. In her memoir, Yanina refrained from judging people for their decisions and actions. Instead, she tried to understand people's choices and the situations and relay that to the reader. The book is filled with examples of the human capacity to perform logically irreconcilable acts. An early case was that of a Ukrainian janitor of a building neighboring Yanina's in Lvov. Before the, before the war, Yanina exchanged pleasantries with this janitor. In summer 1941, the man showed another side of a murderer of his Jewish neighbors. Still, that did not stop him from showing compassion when he chose to save the Melbergs. He lied to his fellow Ukrainian militiamen that the couple was not actually the Jewish Melbergs they were looking for. Finally, Yanina's story highlights the importance of ongoing historical research to bring such stories to light and to ensure that we honor and remember the victims and the survivors and to understand the past. We believe that this story and Yanina's story also offers educational value. And for the educators among our attendees today, there is much to draw about the history of the Holocaust, but also about the experiences of ethnic Poles under Soviet and German occupations. Majdanek, was both part of the largest mass murder operation of the Holocaust and a major place of confinement of ethnic Poles. Our book explains the history of the camp, its creation, its changing roles, and the prisoner experiences. But most importantly, the book is an account of a Jewish Holocaust survivor who pursued an unusual mode of survival and engaged in extraordinary resistance, relief, and rescue efforts on behalf of Poles. And we hope that Yanina's story will inspire you and that you will share it within your communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh,
Well, yes, I will not pretend that we don't know each other, Joanna and Barry. Um, this is a fascinating story, history that um, I still want to learn more and more about, and I'm sure um, so does our audience. And um, I want to encourage our audience to direct their questions to our speakers to chat. Um, and we have a couple of questions already, so I'm going to proceed with those. Um, I will direct questions to both of you. And please um, just feel free to jump in and address them. Um, one of the questions which I found really interesting as well uh, from our audience is um, about Janina's own experience of, after all, we say that she um, saved so many lives, she went through so many adventures, and yet she survived as a Jewish woman during these years in such a dangerous environment. So did Yanina ever come close to being exposed as a Jew? Not as a Jew. Um, she did come very close to being arrested for her resistance activities. In fact, twice she was very nearly arrested by the Gestapo, the one time where they set a trap for her. And unfortunately, one of her co-workers was caught in it and was killed. Uh, but no, we don't think she was ever suspected as a Jew. She was that effective in playing the role of the composed, indomitable countess. Uh, and um, as far as we know, nobody ever questioned that. I'm going to jump to uh, a different type of a question here. I really um, am interested in how you came across this memoir because I, I believe there's a fascinating story there too. Um, and um, please, would you share it with us? Yes. This comes back to 1989. I gave a conference paper on Maidanic. And after the panel was over, a historian I didn't know, Arthur Funk of the University of Florida, handed me a carbon copy manuscript explaining that it was the memoir of Polish mathematician, Jewish mathematician, Yanina Mailberg, who had helped prisoners at Majdanek while pretending to be a Polish Christian aristocrat. Uh, and that she had died in 1969, efforts to publish her memoir had failed. So he was giving a copy to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, but also wanted me to have this copy because since I was working on Majdanek, he thought, well, maybe I could make some use of it. But you know, the story I read was just so incredible, especially with what I knew about Majdanek and Operation Reinhardt in Lublin. Uh, I really had to question whether it was true. And, and there wasn't any way for me to do that at the time, particularly since I don't know Polish. I mean, I did confirm that there was a Countess Sukodolska. She's mentioned in a few post-war studies and by some of former Majdanek prisoners. Um, but nowhere was there any indication that she wasn't a countess, Sukodolska was an alias, much less that she was a Jew. So I figured some other historian would find it in the archives and had the skills to bring it to light. Uh, but years passed, Funk died. Um, I never forgot the story. Uh, it seemed like nobody had taken a look at it. And I wondered, did I have a responsibility to make sure that it was known if it was true. Uh, so in uh, 2017, I really started looking into it with the help of the internet and found enough to make me think that she might well have been Countess Sukodolska. And so that's when, thanks to Deborah Dwork, I was able to connect with Joanna, whom I only knew by then as uh, an expert on the Holocaust in Poland. Yeah. Uh I knew there was <laughs> a fascinating story there. And uh, following up with that, so you found a, a scholar who uh, would help you with doing this research. So where did this research take both of you? I 
can imagine only because she was traveling to so many places and she was in so many different organizations, operations. You must have conducted research in multiple languages in different countries. How did that go? <laughs> You're absolutely right, Asya. And yes, the research took us on these journeys. I like to call them archival and genealogical because we were doing both at the same time. We were trying to find information to confirm Yanina's identity, a Jewish identity even further, to find out about her background, about her family. We, But we also were looking for information about her wartime activities. So this was really a fascinating journey. And we looked into multilingual, many lang different languages, mainly Polish and German, because of uh, the document, because Janina was based in Poland, the documents, wartime reports, post-war documents were in Polish, but also in German, right? So we had that. We did research in eight or nine countries on three, four continents. Um, and we found, fantastic information really from Jewish organizations with which Henry corresponded to try to get Yanina out of Poland while she was still living there under, under her false identity. With this, we discovered a cache of letters that Yanina wrote to her friend in New York while Yanina was touring the US. Uh, and in that collection, we also found letters, I mean, not letters, I'm sorry, photographs of, um, of, of Yanina. So that was very special for us. Another very interesting um, interesting source in terms of photographs to see what, what did she look like, to see her kind of circle that she interacted with was a commemorative album in honor of her professor. And that's how the, that's, that's where we, that's, that's, that's the source of the, the photograph of Yanina that is on the cover of the book. But we, there are also other kind of uh, other stories of things that we didn't find in the archives that we were hoping to find. We came across a, an empty folder, um, you know, Mark Janina Suchodolska. We were hoping to find something inside, right? A report, something, but it was empty. So either someone borrowed it many years ago or it disappeared otherwise, we don't know. We also did not find any documents about her that were prepared by the Polish security service. I mean, after the war in the 1940s, Janina worked for the Polish government. She traveled abroad. She must have been surveilled. She must have had a passport. We did not find uh, documents like this, no. Um, so in finding um, some more information about her, learning about her experiences. Uh, did you learn about um, her personal story in terms of um, if she had any family members uh, or if her all of her family members were murdered during the Holocaust? Um, what was um, that side of history for Yanina like? We discovered in the course of help that we received uh, in Uruguay and in, in Argentina, that Yanina had two sisters. One of them immigrated to Uruguay, the other to Argentina. And the sisters did not have children, so we were not able to connect with descendants. However, once in, when Yanina died in 1969, Henry married Yanina's sister, who came from Uruguay. And we have photographs of them. So this is a Kind of you know another layer to this uh, to this story. Yanina and Henry did not have children of their own. Um, as we were finishing the book, the that draft was completed in production. Our research continued. I mean, Barry and I are fascinated by this story, and we still continue uh, the the research part. We still want to know more about about Yan about Yanina, and through various networks, including the help of a Jewish genealogist in Poland and through social media, which is fantastic for making these kinds of connections, we were able to contact Yanina and Henry's niece. This niece from Israel 
uh, originally from Israel, lived with the Melbergs in Chicago when she was going to, to school. So she knew Yanina. She heard snippets of information. And Barry and I had this really special opportunity to meet with the niece who now lives in the UK and to talk with her. And the niece said, you know, whatever you know about, about Yanina, but what she did, it's true. That's yeah, one, one of the things, uh, amongst the things we didn't find were uh, any birth records for Yanina, for her parents, uh, for her siblings. So we know she had two sisters. Maybe she had more. We, we, we haven't been able to find that out. Um, since you mentioned the documents, like, did you, because she traveled so much, were you been able to locate like her travel documents or maybe passports, IDs? Uh, no. I was able to get her US immigration records through a Freedom of Information Act request, but no, we, we never found her her Polish passport, as, as Joanna mentioned. It should be there somewhere. Right. Uh, well, to Poland, we have from our audience a very interesting question. Um, did Poles uh, she saved ever learn she was their rescuer and if they did did they learn that she was Jewish or is her story known now in Poland no her story is not known now in Poland uh, the book will be published in Polish so we hope it will be known um, there were some people who knew that the countess rescued them, you know, and credited her, some Maidanic prisoners, but also at some of the transit camps uh, where she was able to help prisoners. So and she was fairly celebrated in Lublin for what she did for people. Uh, but no, they never, they never learned her true identity. When the war ended, she still felt that it was too dangerous for her to reveal her true identity as uh, both a Jew and as a member of the anti-communist resistance, which was being persecuted by the new communist rulers. Uh, and so, uh, you know, she didn't want to invite suspicion uh, and she couldn't be sure what her co-workers would think uh, if they knew she was Jewish. So she kept her false identity. Um, something that I always ask uh, about um, a new book that was the result of long research um, to authors is what was the most uh, surprising um, either event or item that you discovered or learned about Yanina during this process that I mean, you already knew that it was going to be an adventure <laughs> uh, <laughs> to research her, but what were some of the things that surprised you, even though you were going into the process knowing that it was an incredible story? Yeah, I, I don't think we could cut it to just one thing. Just just getting a memoir <laughs> was a surprise. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that, that we learned very early, that Joanna found very early on in the Polish records, was this whole account that Joanna mentioned when uh, Janina was able to get the release of more than 2,000 prisoners from Majdanek, these Poles who had been dumped there, mostly children and the elderly. Uh, and it's a very dramatic scene, the way it's reported in the wartime records. Uh, but Yanina makes no mention of it in the memoir. So this was our first indication that she actually did more than the memoir even claims. Uh, the thing that most blew my mind was when we realized that the SS official who helped her get the release of those prisoners was the manager of Operation Reinhardt. So a man who by that time had the blood of more than one and a half million Jews on his hands. I think for me, it was just all the activities that, and that, that she engaged in, that was really astonishing and, and, and something that was really interesting to me to find out more and more about it. And the more we read in the report, I mean, the more surprised we were, wow, she did all that. And it's documented, it's right there in the record, in the wartime records. Um, and I think another another thing connected to to the research 
was how much information we were able to find. I mean, Barry started with a reference, right, from a from a uh, from a book review, right, um, that kind of that made her realize, mm, there is, you know, this is this is a this could be a confirmation. There's something to the story, and. Over the years, we really reached out to a variety of archives and private archives, organizational archives, to people with, to whom we thought there might be a connection. This is how we, uh, we made a connection to a son of the Melbrooks family friend, family, I mean friends in, in Canada who shared photographs with us of the Melbergs and of his parents together. So I think just the process itself was of discovering this information that it exists. In just one other mention is that in a Jew, in a Canadian Jewish organization that we reached out to, we received documents about confirming that Janina escaped from Poland. I mean, we would never have imagined to find something like that, and we and we did. And so we are very grateful to all the archivists and the librarians who assisted us over the years and who shared with us this invaluable information. Yes, this really uh, sounds fascinating. I mean, uh, and and uh, we all are looking forward to the new discoveries you're going to come up with uh, since you said that you're continuing this research because um, apparently <laughs> there is still so much more to learn about um, this her journeys, multiple of those. Um, so since you are um, going to continue the research, do you mind sharing some of those um, uh, checks that you're going to take, the questions that you're going to um, try to address in your future research? You mean about about Yanina? About Yanina. Continuing. Yanina. Well, yeah. we are interested in anything that we can that we can find about her, about her, about her childhood, about her upbringing, about her parents, about her siblings. We don't know if they left Poland before the war. Uh, what happened to them? I mean, we don't we don't know anything. Um, so anything that we could find about Yanina is something that is is of interest to us. Okay, well, um, and I mean, you um, addressed uh, every single question of our audience members meticulously, and we're really grateful for uh, your time um, joining us tonight to um, uh, for the first virtual uh, event um, about the counterfeit countess. And um, we hope that uh, soon we will hear more about her and have an opportunity to meet again and share with our audience. And um, if um, our audience doesn't have any more questions, um, allow me to then thank um, our wonderful speakers. Uh, allow me to thank once again, everyone at Change who made this Zoom event possible. Fran, Linda, Rachel, Susan, Suzanne, um, our wonderful uh, board members, volunteers and staff, our sponsors, Pam and Howard Dorman, and our donors and members for their generosity and support. Huge thanks to our audience for jo joining our International Holocaust Remembrance Day program tonight. And um, we are having a number of virtual and in-person programs upcoming. So please follow our webpage, uh, sign up, register for our e events, and until our next meeting virtually or a change in person. Thank you everyone and have a good night.